turn in our Bibles to Mark chapter number 2, Mark number chapter 2 today. I want to preach today on the elements of a miracle, the elements of a miracle. You know, I, I believe that, that God is still a miracle working God, a God who can do the supernatural, that can do the unusual, that can do that that man can't do, that that man cannot do, God can do. And uh, I'm glad we have that kind of God today. Amen. He is a supernatural, all-powerful, all-knowing God who is able to do far and exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or that we think, according to the power that worketh in you. In other words, God uh, brings us into this thing. He brings us into it. And uh, this is a story that's very familiar in the Bible of the man who was brought to uh, to Jesus carried by his friends. And let's read this story today in Mark chapter 2, beginning verse 1. Stand with me, please. And we'll read down through verse 12 of Mark chapter 2. I'm glad you're here today in the house of the Lord, and what a blessing it is. I hope everyone uh, will remember us in prayer as we leave in the morning and excited about the trip, and I believe that God's going to do wonderful things. And, uh, you know, uh, 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 you say, well, we don't see a great host of people saved today here in America. But I'll tell you what, I like to see them saved anywhere they'll get saved. Amen? And uh, I know there's some folks don't don't even believe in that. They don't think you could have, you know, several hundred people saved today. And uh, my question is, why not? Uh, is God not able to do that? Does God not want to do that? And uh, what would... Uh, that one preacher said, I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. I want to say, well, what would you do if you preached? And, uh, and uh, 1,200 people come forward to be saved. Tell them go back. They couldn't be saved. It's too many. Huh? I wouldn't do that, would you? I'd tell them exactly what the Bible said. Amen. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So it's good to be saved today. My, uh, Mark chapter 2 verse 1 And again he entered into Capernaum after some days and it was noise that he was in the house. I'm going to turn this thing off before it rings today. And straightway many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was bore of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why did this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they had so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way unto thy house. And immediately he arose, and took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it, on this fashion. Lord, I thank you for your word and I pray in Jesus' name that you'll open unto us today the scriptures and give us the truth of your word. Thank you, Lord, for each one who's come today to the house of God, those listening uh, uh, by radio or by uh, internet or maybe the TV program. We don't know, Lord, uh, where all these things go, uh, internet, all the various avenues today. God, I'm just glad your word goes out and I'm thankful, God, that it has power and authority. And Lord, that you today, your word is like a hammer that breaks a rock and to pieces. And God, you said uh, 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 that, God, your word would not return to you void, but accomplish that which you please and prosper in the things whereto you send it. 
And so we can preach your word today with confidence that the word of God will get the job done. You save the unsaved one. You reclaim the backslidden one. You encourage the discouraged and correct us where we're wrong and help us be built up in the Lord today. And all that you do will give you the praise and the honor and the glory for it all. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you be seated. Thank you today. I appreciate that. This wonderful account of a man brought to Jesus by his friends and how they tore the roof off to lower him down to the Lord Jesus Christ. A very wonderful story uh, in the life and the ministry of our Lord. And I believe we can learn much today about the elements of a miracle. I want to preach on that today. The elements of a miracle. What is involved when miracles take place? What, what is involved in the miraculous today? First of all, I'd like you to write down uh, that when there are miracles, there has to be a problem. There has to be a problem. A miracle is not needed when there is no problem. Do you understand that? you realize that? I mean, if you're in good health, you don't need a miracle of healing, do you? If you, uh, my friend, uh, have no problems, then you don't need a miracle. If you have no needs, you don't need a miracle. Think about all of the miracles in the Bible. I was thinking about all of the miracles in the Bible and how all of them uh, were centered around a problem. The children of Israel were there at the Red Sea and here comes Pharaoh and the chariots are coming after them and they can't go back and they can't go forward and they're in peril, they're in danger and what does God do? He's parts the Red Sea and they walk through on dry ground. Praise God. There's a solution for the problem. Uh, God just parted the Red Sea and let them walk on dry ground. Amen. I'll tell you, friend, listen, there's a God today uh, that can take our problems uh, and turn them around to get glory and honor for His name. Uh, thank God for the problem if it brings a miracle. Amen. You know what? So many miracles. You know, the life of Elisha, all, about all his miracles were centered around a problem. Somebody came and said, Oh, I, I was chopping wood and the axe head went in the river. That's like me. I borrow something, it tears up. Don't you? Amen. Oh, what am I going to do? I borrowed this thing. I'm going to have to buy my new axe. And what did he do? Hey, he threw a stick in the water and the axe head swung back to him and he picked it up. And, uh, and that miracle, because of a problem, a woman came and said to Elisha, she said, you know, uh, 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 the debtors are coming. They're going to put my boys in slavery because we can't pay our debts. And Elisha said, you gather up every pot and pan you can borrow in this country and bring in here. And said, what do you got in the house? She said, I got a little cruise of oil. Well, you gather all your pans up. And said, you pour that oil out. And you know what? She poured oil and all of those things were filled. And sold it and paid the debt. And the boy stayed free. A problem produced a, a miracle, praise God. So many times we have problems uh, in our life that, uh, that demand a miracle. There's no other solution other than God to intervene. So a problem... Uh, now, let me say that in Matthew chapter 9, we have this story in three of the Gospels. We have it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in Matthew chapter 9, Matthew tells us that the man was sick of the palsy. The word palsy means that he was paralyzed. Now, we don't know uh, how he got paralyzed. Uh, uh, possibly he was born this way. Or maybe he had an accident. He had a fall. And the result of his fall resulted in him being paralyzed. We have that today. You know, in all of our medical advancements today that we've had throughout our modern age, they've yet to find a cure for someone paralyzed. They've yet to be able to connect. Now, I think they're closer than they've ever been, but they're still not able to repair that nerve when it breaks, that nerve when it's severed. And a paralyzed person, my friend, uh, as there's no cure yet today for that condition. There certainly wasn't a cure in the day of our Lord for someone being paralyzed. Uh, you see, the problem here uh, was one that needed a miracle. Your problem today demands a miracle because you and I, without God, are paralyzed in our sin. We can't do anything about our sin. Our sin is against us. Uh, what are you going to do about your sin today? You said, well, I'll start living right and doing right, trying to do better. That won't do one thing about all the sin you already have in your sin account. What are you going to do about that old account? It's going to take a miracle, friend. 
It's going to take the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, to cleanse you of your sins. It's going to take the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to regenerate you and make you so you can live for God. You see, the problem demands a miracle today. Let me say that not only do we have a problem, but I want you to write this down. The second thing we see is a plan. Now, these men here, and we don't know who they are. They're unnamed. They're some of the unnamed people in the Bible. In fact, all of them are unnamed. The man in the, that's paralyzed is unnamed. The four men that carry him to the Lord, we don't have their names. But won't it be a blessing in heaven to meet these folks? I, I mean, a special, sweet, wonderful blessing in heaven. Someone to say, uh, come here, I want to introduce you. These are the four men that carried this man to Jesus when he got healed there in the gospel. Won't that be a blessing? We don't have their names. But these men, they began to uh, reason and think about what they could do because they were so burdened for their friend. And I thought about the four leprous men. I preached on this a few weeks ago in 2 Kings chapter 7 and verse 3. You remember how those four leprous men sat outside the gate of Samaria and they were all dying in Samaria and they said, well, if we sit here and do nothing, we'll die. If we go in the city, we'll die. Let's go to the camp of the Syrians. Maybe we'll find something to eat. Maybe they'll kill us. You can just be so dead. But uh, we got to do something. They came up with a plan, those men did. These men in our text came up with a plan. First of all, three things. There's three things about the plan I want you to jot down in the plan. First of all, they, they reason we must locate a solution. We must locate a solution. Now, they heard about Jesus. How do you think they heard about Jesus? In Mark chapter 2 and verse 40, we have another account. Let's look at it real quickly. The Bible said, And there came a leper to him, I don't know if I told you about the mountain preachers. fellow told me he preached a whole sermon on the leaper, uh, naming the leaper, how he'd leaped over God, leaped over salvation. He went through his life leaping, but it's not a leaper, it's a leper, all right? Somebody with leprosy. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and said unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. And he straightly charged him forthwith, sent him away and said unto him, See, thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. But he went out and began to what? What does it say? He went out and began to what? Publish it much. This is what we call today reverse psychology. Jesus said, don't say anything to anybody about this. But you know what he did? He published it much. He told everybody how the Lord Jesus had cleansed him, had healed him of leprosy. But go thy way, showed thyself to the priest. And verse 45, he began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter. Isn't that interesting language? I mean, he is on fire telling people about what Jesus has done for him insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city but was without the desert places and they came to him from every quarter. These four men probably heard about this leper that had been touched by the Lord and healed by the Lord. And they got to thinking about their friend over there paralyzed in awful shape. And they said, you know what? Man, if he can heal a leper, nobody's ever been able to do that. There's no cure for leprosy. He can do that. Maybe he can raise up our friend. And so we got to locate the solution. Now, listen to me today, friend. When there's a problem in your life, you need to locate the answer and the solution and I'll tell you today, the answer is not to you going to the world or going to sin or going to alcohol and drugs and all of that mess. The answer is you coming to Jesus with your problem. There's the answer. There's the solution. we got to locate. They located the solution. The second thing now is transportation. Well, we've located. Now let's, trans let's transport our friend. Let's get our friend there. 
And so they come up with a plan. We've got to get him to Jesus. How are we going to do that? Well, let's build us a bed. Let's build us some means to, we'll load him up and we'll carry him to the Lord. Praise God. You know what, my friend, this thing of getting people to God is a hard job. There's a lot of work involved. There's sacrifice involved. It's not an easy thing. It's not a frivolous thing. There's a lot involved in it. There's a commitment involved. It takes some perspiration and sweat and work and some planning. And it takes somebody to pay the bill. It takes somebody to give their time and give of their efforts to the things of God. I'll tell you what we ought to do today, friend. We that know the answer and know the solution, we ought to give our life to getting people to the Lord. Praise God. Listen to me, friend. I cannot save anybody. I, sometimes I've been in meetings and I've had people say, well, oh, thank you for saving me, preacher. I've had people say that. That preacher saved me. You've all heard that language. And, uh, and I don't be mean. I know what they mean. But uh, technically speaking, I can't save anybody. No man can save anyone. Nobody can forgive somebody's sin. No one should take confessions from a person from somebody as though they could do something about their sin. That is ridiculous. But what we can do is we can get people to Jesus. Amen. And that is the great privilege God gives us in this life. They said, let's get our friend to the Lord. He is the answer. And then the third thing in this plan was elimination. I like these men, and I'm going to deal with it a little bit later, about what they did, what means they went through to get this job done. But they were determined that nothing was going to stop them. If they've got to tear the roof off the house, they'll tear the roof off to get their friend to Jesus. Hey, listen, we ought to be more determined today in the work of God and eliminate the obstacles that are going to come and go on for God. Amen. There's a plan. There's a problem. Number three, there's a passion involved here. A passion involved. The elements of a miracle. You know what? Here are some men. Well, these are really precious men, aren't they? I don't know these guys, but we don't know anything about them. We don't know one, we don't know anything about their personal life. But they're some good men. They've got a good heart because they're doing something for somebody else. They're doing something for somebody else. They go to work and they construct a bed and then they carry their friend to the Lord. But the greatest thing about these men is the fact that they have faith as they're doing this that God is going to do something. Now, I'd like you to notice verse 5 of our text that says, When Jesus saw whose faith? Their faith. Not His faith, but their faith. Now sometimes today we have people who talk a lot about healing and I don't want to be mean, I don't come off in a mean way, but they talk a lot about healing and they say it's always God's will for you to be healed. And then you go to that individual, you go to a big healing meeting, and people go, and they don't get healed. And that same man says, well, it wasn't my fault, it's your fault. You didn't have enough faith. Well, if they had enough faith to go to that guy, uh, he ought to have had enough faith to heal them. If he's going to tell them that. See? But do you realize here that Jesus did not mention the faith of the man who needed to be healed? He rather uh, recognizes the faith of those that brought the man when he saw their faith. And no doubt, if we could see the scene with our Lord in that house teaching, and he's trying to teach, and all of a sudden he hears this commotion, you know. And man, there's uh, uh, pry bars, prying out nails. and I don't know what all was involved. Probably it it was stone slabs on this roof up there, and they're chiseling and they're working, and somebody said, what's going on? And they finally get a hole dug out and there's those four men looking down at the Lord and you see him looking up at those men and you know when he looks at their face, he saw their faith. And, uh, and all three accounts mention the fact that when he saw their faith, uh, he was pleased with that. Did you know that God is pleased with faith today, friend? The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please God for he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Boy, I want you to believe God today, friend. I want you to begin to believe God for miracles. I want you to believe God and take God at His Word. And as a church and as a people, we need to learn to believe God and have faith because God's pleased with that. 
The Bible said the just shall live by faith. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. It's impossible to please him without faith. He's pleased with faith. We see the passion that they had. Uh, You will never love anyone more than if you try to get that person saved and try to get them to God. Amen. No greater love is ever shown for anyone. I want our church to always be about getting people saved. I want that to be the priority of everything we do. It ought to be the heartbeat of every one of us to see men, women, boys, and girls saved by the grace of God. Bus kids saved. Our people in our youth saved. It doesn't matter where, where, our radio work, TV work, everything we do, mission work, everything we do, it has at its base, at, uh, souls, souls, souls. God give us souls. God help us win people. Help us reach the lost at any cost. There's nothing greater we can do than to win souls and get people saved by the grace of God. Then I want you to notice not only the problem and the plan and the passion that's involved right down number four, if there's going to be a miracle, the fourth element in a miracle, there's got to be a person, and let me say, uh, the person, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the source of all miracles. Now, verse number one tells us in our text, and again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. Let me say, that when we think about the person of Christ, I want you to write down under that today. First of all, he couldn't be hid. He couldn't be hid. It was noise that he was in the house. You know what? Uh, When the Lord Jesus Christ comes in, your life, when he comes in your home, when he comes in your business, when he comes in the affairs of your life, I'm telling you right now, it can't be hid, amen. I remember one time years ago, I was in Hazard, Kentucky, and I had a mine over there. I had this mine that I carried uniforms to. And they got in a dispute over there one time, had a war over there in that place. And uh, I pulled in, I pulled in there one time, and a man was standing outside the door with a machine gun. Now, I never had seen that before. I was a kid just a couple years out of high school. And there was a thousand, at least a thousand bullet holes on the doors and on the building. They had had an absolute war there. And uh, I got out there and I said, what's going on? said, nothing to worry about. I said, nothing to worry about. I said, it looks to me like there's something to worry about if you're standing here with a machine gun. And so, man, I mean, you talking about getting that stop worked and getting the paperwork signed and getting out. One guy told me, he said, I got a hole in a pair of pants. I said, good luck, buddy. I said, I'm not going through them today. I'm getting out of here. My mama didn't raise too big a dummy, amen. I wasn't hanging around, talk, uh, uh, talk uh, social things. I got in there and got out. But I never will forget, I was in that mine one day, and a fellow come up to me, and he said to me, he said, you're a Christian man, aren't you? I never had talked to him before or anything else. He came up to me and said that to me. Out of the blue, just out of the blue, no coal miner. You're a Christian man, aren't you? I said, yes, sir, I am. I know Jesus. And I asked him if he's saved. He said, no, I'm not. But I knew you was a Christian. You know what? I'm going to tell you something, friend. We ought to have enough God in us that the world can tell, that people can tell there's something different. He shouldn't be hid in you and I. Amen. When the Lord is in our life, when He's in the house, when He's in the church, it shouldn't be hid. It ought to be an evident thing, praise God. I'll tell you, He can't be hid when He's there. Amen. Let me say that He couldn't be heard. Luke chapter 5, if you'll hold your place in Mark, in Luke chapter 5 and verse 18, I want you to notice what the Bible said. In Luke chapter 5 and verse 18, page 1078 in your Schofield, And behold, men brought brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in. Now, the word means there is an interesting word. And uh, I want to take just a couple minutes and say that our forefathers in history, there's an interesting thing on the word means in in the history of Baptist people in America. In the 1820s in the United States, there was a split in the Baptist churches in America between 
what would be called missionary Baptists and primitive Baptists. Y'all often wondered about where did the primitive Baptists come from? What are the primitive Baptists? The primitive Baptist people movement said they're very strong Calvinistic. They call them sometimes hard shell. And they believe what will be, will be. Who's going to be saved is going to be saved. One fellow said, I was raised up in Kentucky and I was taught that if you was born to drown, you'd never hang. I thought, well, that's pretty strong, isn't it? And, uh, but they split over this word means. And those primitive Baptist people said, God needs no means whatsoever to save anybody. God doesn't need a Bible. God doesn't need a missionary. God doesn't need Sunday school. God doesn't need tracts. God doesn't need a preacher. God needs no means. He can save anybody He wants to by uh, declaring them saved even without the gospel. And the missionary Baptist people said, no, God uses all means. He uses all means, all Christ-honoring means to get people saved. We are means Baptists. Amen. I believe in using every means I can use to get everybody saved I can. And now, a lot of it is through computers, isn't it? YouTube and all of that type of thing. And, and the internet. You know, this service is going around the world today by the means of, uh, of a computer. And we, we got a report some years ago. Uh, a man came in to... Brother David Pyers over there and was telling him, he said, uh, he said I've been in Afghanistan. And he said, did you know that, uh, that our, our boys have been using your church service as our church service in Afghanistan? He told him about several that had been saved, those soldier boys over there in Afghanistan. That's absolutely fabulous. That's wonderful, isn't it? Praise God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You said there's bad things on it. I know there are, but I'm glad there's some good on it. You see, whatever means we can use, we want to use for God. And these men sought means, a way. They sought a way to bring Him in and to lay Him before Him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring Him in, because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop. So Jesus was in this house. He couldn't be hid. He couldn't be heard because of the crowd. They couldn't access Him. So you know what? Praise God they do. My friend, they take the roof off. And I want you to write down thirdly, He, he couldn't be hard. When the Lord looked and saw those men uh, 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 looking down at Him, I'll tell you what, it touched His heart. I believe we can touch the heart of God. I believe we can touch the heart of God. Amen. Listen, dear friend. It touched his heart when he saw their faces uh, and saw the faith in their faces. And as they said, we're going to let him down to you, Lord. Praise God. Oh, I'm glad there's a person today of the miracles. But I've got to deal with another thing quickly. Number five, write this down. Now, before a miracle can take place, this is very important, we must take care of the priority. Write down the priority. Now, what is the priority as we go back to our text there in Mark 2. What is the priority here in this situation? Verse number 5 says, When Jesus saw their faith, He said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be healed. You know what it says? What did He say? Thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, this is very important to this text and to the understanding of our, of our lesson today from the Word of God, is we must understand that there is a need greater than the miracle today that you need in your life. Because a lot of folks will say, oh man, I need a job, I, I, need, uh, I, need, to be, I need healing in my body, I, need, uh, I have a financial problem, I have a problem... Uh, whatever it might be. And you think that that is the great problem. But that's not the great problem. The great problem, the priority, is to take care of the sin issue first. I never will forget when uh, I, I got right with the Lord 
years ago in a little church where Daddy pastored, and there was a precious man there that got to come into that church. And boy, everybody was so burdened for him, and he wasn't saved. And Dad always believed in praying for people and anointing them with oil, and uh, he believed in that. But he said, I can't do that till that man gets saved. Boy, it just burdened my dad. And when I remember that, I believe it was on a Sunday morning, that fellow came forward and got saved there in that church. Boy, I mean, everybody was so rejoicing in salvation. And he said, now we can pray for your healing. I never forgot that as a young Christian. That made an impression upon me that, that the priority in that man's life, listen to me, dear friend, what good would it be for this man to have been healed and not to have his sins forgiven? All he would have had is two legs to walk into hell with. Now I want you to hold your place and go to Matthew chapter 5 just for a moment. And I want you to look at verse 29. Notice here this priority as our Lord lays this out in Matthew chapter 5. And verse 29, he said this. Sometimes in Scripture people don't understand what he's talking about. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and that, thou, and that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. What is the Lord saying here? He's saying there's a need, there's a priority in your life today greater than a physical problem or a financial problem or, or a marriage problem. That problem is a sin problem for Him. That's a problem that you're, die, you're going to die and go to a burning, screaming hell without God. And that is the worst thing there is. It's a whole lot worse than being paralyzed. Be better to get saved, paralyzed, and go to heaven than to be healed and get your body and get your legs back and die and go to hell. It'd be better for you to go to heaven blind than for you to be healed and get your sight and go to hell, uh, my friend, seeing. It'd be better for you, our deaf department, it would be better for you to get saved as a, as a deaf person than for you to get your hearing and, and not to have no God and to die and go to hell. Hearing! Because one day you're going to hear, one day you're going to see, one day you're going to walk. Yes, if you get saved, I promise you, that'll take place in heaven. It might take place here, God may do it here, but I know it'll take place in heaven. The priority here, may we never forget that there is nothing more important in all of this world than for you to know your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That's the greatest need any person has, is to know you've been birth out of death and the, and the life, from darkness unto light. That's the need today, friend, to get born again and saved by the grace of God. You make sure of that. Our Lord deals. Now, did I say that the religious people were offended at our Lord here? This is very important for us to understand. Go back to our text in Mark 2. The Bible said in verse 6, but there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. These men did some reasoning too, but it's the wrong kind. And they said, why did this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Well, if they had said this now, if they had said, who could raise up a paralyzed man but God? If they had reasoned that way, then they would have to have concluded that Jesus was God. So what does our Lord answer them? And immediately when Jesus perceived in His Spirit that they were so reasoned within themselves, He said unto them, Why reason you these things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say the sick to the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed and walk. Now please think of this this morning in the message. The work of forgiving sins is an invisible work. No one can see that. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, But faith 
But faith is the, uh, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, and it is the evidence of things not seen. So you know what our Lord is going to do? He is going to do an invisible work in this man's heart first. And then he's going to do a visible work to prove he had done the invisible work. Is everybody with me this morning? Did you know that's exactly the way it is in our lives? Nobody could see what happened when you got saved. Nobody could see today, friend, what God would do in your heart by you getting born again and saved by the grace of God. But if you really, truly get saved, everybody will see an evidence of it. Uh, you'll be a new person. Hallelujah. There was a fellow one time, a man had got saved. He'd been a drunkard all of his life. He had a drunkard's home. He'd been raised by a drunkard. He was a drunkard. Little old children about starved to death. They didn't have firewood. They didn't have anything. Lived in little shotgun houses. They'd move every time when Rick came to and all of that. And this man got saved, and a couple infidel men down at the store got it making fun of him. Said, "Oh, and you believe a Bible?" He said, "Yes, sir, I do." He said, "Well, tell me about the miracle, how Jesus changed the water to wine." That man started crying; tears started coming down his face. He said, "I don't know if I understand all about that. I was like, wasn't there." But I believe it. But he said, let me tell you about a miracle I know about. He said, in my life, God changed the wine to milk and cereal and groceries for my family. We got heat now at the house. And I'm holding a job. My wife fixes a good supper when I come home. We go to church together. And we have family altar in our home. There's joy in our home. Used to be cussing and fighting and used to be violence. But now... We sing and pray. and We go to church together and worship God. And we love each other. That's the miracle God did in my life. It might have been invisible when He did it. But now everybody can see, praise God. There's something different. Amen. Oh, I'm glad today that God is able to do that. But I want us to think just for a moment about not only the problem and the plan and the passion, I won't be just a few more minutes, and the person, the priority, but let's look at the persistence that's involved in a miracle. Now, these men here speak of the church and speak of us, the part we have in the miraculous work of God. They were aware that they could do nothing about this man's condition but they were persistent to get him to someone who could. And uh, they reasoned, uh, <clears throat> as they got to that crowd, as they got to where Jesus was, they said, we can't go any further. We can't get to him because of the crowd. Now, so one of them said, well, if we can't go in, why don't we take him and let him down? said, you mean tear the roof off? Yes, tear the roof off. Now they had, to, they had to get over there and they had to get up on the house holding on to the ropes. And the first thing they had to do is they had to pull their buddy up on top of the house. This is everybody now doing their job because it's only going to take one person to mess up here and this paralyzed man's going to be a dead paralyzed man, okay? They get him up on the house. They tear the roof off of the house, probably a flat roof there in Israel. And now they've got to lower him down to where Jesus is. And again, this demands that everybody do their part. You can't have a slacker here. You can't have one here that lets up and quits. But it bothers me. We've got so many quitters today. They quit in the middle of the job. Can't quit now. It's going to be catastrophic if you quit. You said, ah, what I do is not that important. Let me ask you something. Was it important what each one of those four guys did? Is everybody with me this morning? Listen now. Was it equally as important that everyone do their part and do it the right way and do it at the right timing 
that they not do their own thing? I mean, one guy said, I'm not lowering my rope. Well, it flipped him over. One of them said, I'll just let go of mine. It would have flipped him over. Everybody had to do their job. They had to do it the right way. They had to do it all in accord. They had to do it in unity. You know what a picture of the church this is. What we need to get in our mind today is that we have a job given to us by God and it's vital and it's important and it's essential that we do this. Because if we don't, there may be some soul perish and go to hell because I was not willing to do my part. Church, I want to challenge you this morning to wake up and say, I'm not going to sit on the sidelines any longer. Most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time people that get out of church and quit church is because they never really got in all that good in them. Eunuchus fell out of the window. I've preached on it many times. I asked people across the country, why did Eunuchus fall out of the window? You remember Eunuchus in the book of Acts? How do you remember Eunuchus? You'd cuss too if you fell out of the window. That's how you remember his name, Eunuchus. I hope you wouldn't cuss, but that's how you remember his name. Why did he fall out of the window? You said because he went to sleep. I still does not answer the question. Could he not have fallen in? Could he not have rolled forward when he went to sleep? But he fell out. Why did he fall out? Here's the answer. It's profound. He was more out than he was in. You know what we ought to determine today? I'm going to get more in than I'm out. Because if I do go to sleep and fall, I hope you don't go to sleep in church, but if I do go to sleep and fall, I won't fall out. And, and, and Spurgeon said about that, don't fall to sleep, fall out of a window today. There's no apostles bring you back to life. The persistence these men had, they did their part. And let me say that I'd like to have been there. Look, can you get the picture now? Jesus is talking. All of a sudden there's this commotion and they're pride and they're working and, and our Lord is interrupted. I want to tell you something today, friend. Listen to me, church. Bell Meadows Church, listen to me. I promise you God loves for sinners to interrupt Him. God loves for a church to interrupt Him. God, let's see a people that are praying, get a hold of God and believe God and interrupt Him. Amen. Oh, we don't want the wrong kind of interruptions, but I tell you, we need some of these uh, uh, interruptions that will interrupt the, uh, the average thing around here. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we walk. Think not. I want to ask you a question this morning as I close. Do you have a problem? Do you have a problem? Why don't you recognize that today? You backslid on the Lord, lost. Got some things in your life that need to be changed. You got a problem? Listen, recognize that problem. Well, uh, uh, let me ask you something. Do you have a plan about the problem? What are you going to do about the problem? Is there a passion today? Yes. We care today. Does Jesus care? I know He cares. And I know the person that can help you, His name is Jesus. But the priority is going to be that you take care of the sin problem first. Let's be persistent, church. Till our Lord comes, or till we leave this life, let's be persistent. You say, Brother, I don't know why God's left me here. He's left you here to serve Him. He's left you here for you to love Him. He's left you here so you can grow in your love for Him and your trust in Him. And I'll tell you, our lives will soon be gone and over. We'll soon be gone from here. And what's done for Jesus is what'll matter. I'm glad that we can have miracles today. Let's bow our heads. Thank you for your comfort, for your attention.